who's our first in-person speaker, uh, possibly ever, but certainly in three years, and I'm so excited he's here. Uh, Kevin got his BA in chemistry, just, just like myself, uh, at uh, Willamette University in Oregon, and then he did his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, where he uh, stayed on to establish the first campus-wide light sheet microscopy facility at the BioFrontiers Institute. And today, uh, since 2022, he's a tenure track professor at the Linda Hill Department of Bioinformatics and the Cecil H. and Ida Green Center of Systems Biology at the UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. So Kevin, I'm super excited. Thanks for coming. Well, if I am the first since the uh, dark times, it's really nice to be back. And I was just saying how much I really appreciate kind of getting out of my bubble and talking to people um, and actually seeing human emotion on the other side of this display. So I really appreciate it. I love this place. Um, a long history with several people here. And so it's my pleasure to be here. All right, so today I'm gonna talk about something that's a little bit green. And um, essentially, as uh, Brian said, is I started up my lab essentially last fall. I'd been at UT Southwestern for a long time. I got there in 2014, I did my postdoc. They kept me on as a research track professor. And then like a, like a very stubborn, uh, obstacle, I eventually forced them to give me a tenure track position. And so this is now the research that's going on in my own lab. So we're really focused on developing technologies to study the metastatic cascade. Now this is a prototypical process that is kind of superficially or stereotypically shown as this linear step or sequence of events. And of course, the first thing in the metastatic cascade is that the cell actually has to have some sort of formation of an oncogenic behavior. It has to continue to proliferate uh, irregardless of its environment, at which point it can then locally invade away from that site, that primary tumor formation. It can enter the circulation, at which point it can then travel very long distances, essentially for some types of cancer throughout your entire body, where only a handful of cells, very select cells, can then leave circulation and enter a new site where they can then survive and ultimately try to proliferate. Each one of these steps is kind of, a, you could think of it as like a seed. What may provide you with the ability to do very well at step A or step B may be very different than what you have to do at step D, E, or F. And so if we really wanna study this cascade, I think it's valuable to think of this from a perspective of microscopy. We're all very much um, microscopy people, I assume, in this audience. We want to look at the subcellular localization of signals and activities and, and things like metabolic activity. We don't want to reduce these cells to just bags of proteins like we might do with next-gen sequencing. So from a microscopy perspective, it's very challenging to look at step A, needle in a haystack. Let's say you're looking at melanoma, you actually don't know necessarily where to look to see where's this first cell that's becoming locally invasive. Likewise, if you're actually looking at this part right here, this is also incredibly challenging. And we believe that this is actually one of the major gateways that acts as like a significant barrier towards cancer progression. So this is actually a very rare process where only one in a hundred cells or less actually survive this uh, transport in the vasculature and successfully colonize that distant site. So the question is, why is that cell popular? Or why is that cell successful? What allows that to occur? And to begin actually asking questions like this, you have to have a very good model. And so we reached out to Sean Morrison at UT Southwestern and we started working using his melanoma model. This is a library of 22 patient-derived stage three melanomas that were isolated in clinic. Now, very interestingly, when you put these cells into a mouse, in a very specific type of mouse that's essentially had its immune system abolished, then what happens is that these cells phenocopy what they did in the clinic. So if they metastasize in the clinic, they then metastasize in the mouse. And one of the, and you can see one-to-one -one corresponds with the exception of just one single cell line here. 
The other thing that's very interesting about this model is that they're highly tumorigenic. So a lot of people studying metastasis will inject maybe a million cells into the tail vein. These cells are delivered directly into the blood. They circulate, they get trapped right in the lung. In contrast, we're doing a subcutaneous injection and we can do it with just a handful of cells and you can still create tumors. So it's not necessarily a cancer stem cell or, or a very special cell type that can create this primary tumor. By doing limiting dilution analysis, you can actually see that one in two cells or one in four cells for some of these cancer types is all you need to inject into a mouse to create a primary tumor. And what I find perhaps the most interesting is that they all display kind of distinct organotropisms. So what is organotropism? This is what I find to be a major goal of our research right now. So if you have a, say from patient 487, a melanoma that metastasized preferentially to the kidney, you put it in the mouse, it metastasizes to the kidney. In contrast, patient 481 has preferential metastasis to the liver. So why is it that some go to the kidney and some go to the liver? And so, as I mentioned earlier, this is, in, for melanoma, the assumption at least is that all of these cells are entering general circulation. So they're actually going throughout the entire body, yet they differentially colonize and metastasize in different tissues. So why is that? So our goal is to kind of do the simple microscopy thing and just look. And so, you know, from a, a thought experiment, we can start to say, you know, if we're looking at say metastatic colonization in the lung, is that colonization linear with time? So is it kind of like the primary tumors constantly shedding cells and they're, they're you know, colonizing that distant tissue at a steady frequency? You know, is it that only a handful of cells colonize at which they exponentially grow? Or do we see like an initial bolus of cells followed by essentially clearing out of cells that could not survive, then perhaps a latency period followed by an exponential decay? I think what's very you know, important is that you might come up with different chemical strategies targeting these populations. If it's this one, maybe you need to target the actual leaving of the primary tumor. Whereas if it's this one, maybe we need to start to look at these latent cell populations and identify what molecular features they have. And so we're gonna just do the most obvious thing, which is just comprehensively catalog colonization site, cellular abundance, and cell state. We're gonna do that for three different tissues. Now, of course, we're all non-transparent, which is mildly problematic from an imaging front. So if we're looking at something like the lung, a functional lung has huge complexity. And from an optical perspective, we have regions of mucus, air, uh, you know, extracellular matrix, uh, highly uh, epithelialized tissues. And so from an optics perspective, every one of these interfaces will scatter and aberrate your light. Now, of course, we could use an optical window, but that's going to very much limit us to superficial imaging in this otherwise very large and complex tissue. So the approach that we're using, which is also quite popular, is to use tissue clearing. In this case, what we do is we chemically fix the specimen, so we give up on our live cell imaging capabilities. We then strip the tissue of all of its lipids and leave behind essentially a proteinaceous mass. That's just a phantom of that tissue. And we immerse that protein mass into a solution that has a match refractive index. So all of a sudden you can take this large brain slice here, which is actually a human brain slice, and make it transparent. So you can now go in and look at that at very high resolution. Now the challenge is that there's a lot of different clearing methods and each one of these methods has been typically optimized for brains, although increasingly they're being expanded to other tissues. So you actually have to have an imaging system that's capable of imaging in all these different solvents, whether that be a hydrogel based method like expansion microscopy, which is water based or clarity, which is about 1.45 refractive index or BAB, which is about 1.56. So us and others in this room have adopted these multi-immersion objectives. These are essentially specialized objectives that have a, a very a concave final element here 
that minimizes refraction at that final optical interface. So you can put it into any solvent of varying refractive index and the rays leaving that optical objective all go straight. What's great is that this has a very long working distance. So you can image deep into tissues and it maintains this diffraction limited performance between 1.33 and 1.56. So you can image say water, 54% glycerol and in this Pegasus, which is about a 1.56 solution and maintain this nice diffraction limited um, performance. So we're also all very familiar. So if you have these objectives and you can do nice diffraction limited imaging, you have only a couple choices that remain. The first is, should you use, you know, the, the workhorse of biology, which is the laser scanning confocal microscope, but we all know the advantages and disadvantages here. Essentially, we're going to illuminate above and below our plane of interest. We're going to typically acquire our voxel information in a serial format. So you might have a one microsecond well time and acquire voxels at a megahertz, but ultimately that's still quite slow. On the plus side, you get confocal detection, which makes you robust to scattering and or on the detection sense robust to a lot of aberrations. Now we and everyone else have opted to go with a light sheet microscope, which um, typically confines the illumination to the field, the plane of interest, and most importantly provides massive parallelization. So a modern CMOS camera easily gives you more than 4 million pixels, allows you to reduce your laser power substantially and still have an exposure time that's only a few milliseconds and fly through the imaging. Now, of course, you do that, there's no free lunch. And so us and many, many others have tried to come up with ways to, to get past this one critical limitation. And that is your, your uh, Z resolution depends critically on how you, on both the detection optics and the illumination optics. Specifically, the simplified way to think of this is for very skinny beams, your resolute, if your beam is skinnier than the depth of focus of your detection objective, the resolution is limited or is dictated by that beam waste. However, to get a reasonable field of view, you typically need to use a much larger field of, or a much larger beam. And unfortunately that beam waste, which grows nonlinear with the field of view begins to dominate your resolution. So a good example of this is just this clear tissue image of cortical neurons. We see very nice um, detail in the lateral perspective. However, if we look at it in the axial direction, it's significantly worse. And so that is essentially just demonstrating that the lateral resolution is dictated by your detection optics. But if you have to have a very large beam that covers that entire field of view, you're gonna have pretty poor resolution in that along the optical axis. So Reto Fioka and I back in 2015 came up with this strategy. And this is what we call actually swept light sheet microscopy. And what we do is we use aberration free remote focusing. So this is a method developed by Tony Wilson and Botcherby that allows you to scan a beam in its propagation direction and maintain a very tight diffraction limited beam waste over a very large scan range. So in this case, a lot of the work I'll show you today we can maintain an NA 0.7 beam waste over our plus or minus 170 microns from that um, nominal focal plane. So we can now deterministically position the beam at the edge of our sensor, kind of shown schematically here, and then we sweep it across uh, synchronously with a array of active pixels in the light sheet mode. Um, we do that, like I said, using this um, aberration free remote focusing. So here we bring the light in, we focus it onto a mirror. This mirror is conjugate to the specimen. Scanning the mirror here scans the beam here. Any aberrations introduced by imaging this mirror outside of the nominal focal plane are equal and opposite to the aberrations necessary to create a diffraction limited beam outside the nominal focal plane here. So the advantage here is that we can now decouple this trade-off of field of view and actual resolution, we do give up something. So typically we've been a little bit slower. Our, we can only scan this mirror so fast. And you know, even though we're only collecting photons from the beam waste, we are still illuminating the specimen here. So we also give up a bit of confinement. Um, but for th something like uh, 
you know, clear tissue imaging, and that's something that we're willing to tolerate. Now, of course, there's other ways to do this to most notably the best way, you know, this is one mechanism for decoupling this field of view and axial resolution trade-off. The other is uh, joint deconvolution and imaging from multiple perspectives. So the first system we built was using this NA 0.7 objective. The resolution was, it varied with refractive index. So at high refractive index, we could achieve a lateral resolution of about 310 nanometer at uh, in a Z resolution about 260 nanometers. Um, this provided very nice imaging throughout our entire field of view. So the original microscope at our highest refractive index was about 267 microns and then water is about 320 microns. So this allowed us to do already some pretty beautiful imaging. And so here's an entire hematopoietic stem cell niche that was also imaged with Sean Morrison's lab. If we zoom in on just that square and then zoom in on that square again, we get this level of detail. And so what we can see in gray is the fenestrated sinusoids. In green, we see the peripheral nervous system. And in magenta are these stem cell or progenitor cells that are uh, undergoing maturation in the stem cell niche. So really beautiful. You can begin to see things like these cells going into and out of circulation at these fenestrations in the sinusoids. And you can see kind of provocative things such as the formation of what appears to be synapses between the peripheral nervous system and these stem cells. So there's been a lot of talk about whether or not the uh, nervous system directly or indirectly modulates stem cell maturation. And that this is just begging us to come back and do actually something more with it. We also see just what I consider absolutely stunning cell shapes, uh, morphologies. So on the left, we have these highly specialized leptin receptor positive cells that exist within the stem cell niche. They have these delicate finger-like protrusions. And so this is kind of a, a daisy chain of cells. You see a nucleus, 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 nucleus. And these protrusions essentially wrap around the stem cells and locally secrete growth factors that modulate their differentiation. Now, on the right, we actually see a specialized epithelial cell type from the kidney that to this day is, by my understanding, described incorrectly in physiology textbooks. But these finger-like protrusions, you can see the cell body here, and finger-like protrusions essentially interdigitate and create a very tight single cell uh, tubule that is important for kidney function. I'll maintain a little bit of um, intentional obscureness for the sake of my collaborator. But um, we were able to then isolate or image single cells of this in this tubule network and then segment it and evaluate it for cell shape. So actually what you see in red is areas of flat curvature and areas in blue are high curvature. All right, so everything's good. We have everything we need, right? Yeah, have you told Um, yeah, we typically will, so can, I, can you repeat that? Yeah. So the question is what dyes we're using for this. I think that's, that's a good question. It depends on the tissue. Certain clearing methods will use endogenous fluorescent proteins, uh, like GFP or, I mean, a lot of the biologists created these mice that have TD tomato or DS red reporters. Um, most of the stuff I'm showing you, we're actually doing secondary immunofluorescence against those endogenous fluorescent proteins with dyes like CF555 or uh, CF647 or alexafluors, these sort of dyes. Okay, so if we can image these cells with this sort of detail, then apparently, I guess, you know, we should be good to study cancer. And the challenge that immediately comes up is that, you know, typically when we're doing uh, imaging with the CTS limb, we'll acquire data that's about 320 by 320 by 200 microns, and we'll do it with a sampling of 167 by 167 by 200 nanometers. And by comparison, these tissues are just astronomical. And so the problem that we essentially face is now if we try to image this kidney, uh, lung, or liver with this sort of tile size, it's going to take absolutely forever. So a back of the envelope calculation saying that if we wanted to do diffraction limited 
Nyquist sampling of a lung, it would take you decades to image this with a confocal microscope. It would take us a year with our CTASLM. So we need to do something a little bit more intelligent than just brute force the acquisition. <coughs> and so the approach that we are doing, oh, that brings up one other problem. So not only do we have to, we have massive volumes that we need to acquire, but then there's the fact that this process is actually biologically very noisy. So if we look at one cell type here, that's been all these mice were subcutaneously injected with the same number, same conditions. You can see this one has very nice preferential or essentially every mouse identified at week 15 and 13 is positive for METs in the liver as measured with bioluminescence. Whereas many of these other tissues are much more heterogeneous. So these cells have very weak metastatic burdens and very high metastatic burdens. So you get kind of a, a non-unimodal you know, non distribution. So, but the key is if we really wanna to start to try to find the first cells that actually colonize this tissue, we're gonna to need to be sacrificing these mice at week seven and nine. And there's gonna be a good chance that we have to image the entire tissue and not actually see anything. So it's kind of, we get into this photon counting regime where you actually don't want to see things most of the time. You want to see the rare events that come in. And so not only do we have to image these large samples, but we have to image, image a large number of them. And so the crazy approach that we've come up is we're going to do five time points. And we're going to do seven to 10 mice per time point, each with negative controls, which at this point is coming out to around 500 lungs, livers, and kidneys. So, when I read that, then I think, you know, what did I get myself into? But we're gonna take that cancer biology model. We're gonna take the tissue clearing processes, which we've optimized in house. We're gonna develop computer vision with Gowden's team so that we can really accurately identify these cells in large biological contexts. And we're gonna come up with more of an adaptive, intelligent imaging approach. And so that leads me to this multi-scale clear tissue actually so a light sheet microscope or MCTASLM for short. So this is essentially what happens when you, you have a biological problem and you just take the most pragmatic approach forward. What we did is we created a four axis imaging system. It has two imaging modules that operate independently. We have a macro scale module here, which is essentially a mesospim. On this side, we have our high resolution cleared tissue ASLM and they're essentially welded together. The sample is positioned at the center of these four optical axes, and that allows us to then quickly switch imaging modes between these two different systems. So you guys are probably familiar with Fabian Boyd's work. So he was able to use a single, he, he created mesospim. We're taking the single-sided illumination variant of it. We do, it is an ASLM-like microscope. They're doing low NA illumination beam scanning. So you can do that with an electrotunable lens. And then by using a stop shifted digital SLR lens, you can then create very nice telecentric illumination over a field of view that goes from two to 21 millimeters. On the detection axis, we use this 0 0.63 to 6.3 X uh, mesoscale imaging system. This provides that field of view of 2.1 to 21 millimeters. And in general, this will provide us with about a resolution of five microns, regardless of that field of view. Although sampling gets to be a little bit sparse and we're not at Nyquist at the larger field of view. And this whole thing is positioned on a focusing stage here. So we combine that with the already, you know, proven CTASLM that I discussed earlier. More recently, we were able to improve the aberration-free remote focusing optics and improve that field of view by up to 60%. And we were able to increase the bandwidth by using a more um, recently developed uh, actuated or pneumatically actuated voice coil. So historically, we've done most of our imaging with about a 200 millisecond exposure time, which is actually quite slow by our standards. And by looking at this Bode plot, we're thinking that we should be able to actually increase this up to about a 50 millisecond or 40 millisecond exposure time, which should drastically accelerate imaging. So then equipped with this, we can now do simple things. You know, we can, uh, you know, we can essentially look at this large tissue here, in this case, the liver, 
And within a single acquisition, we can image this entire field of view. So 21 by 21 millimeter field of view. We can go through and identify all the tissue boundaries, perhaps not at a resolution that's sufficient to really detect single cells. So we could then automatically identify the boundaries and then do an exhaustive search at our moderate magnification, say 6x magnification, do automated identification of candidate events. Those events can be whatever you want. So the software we've developed is pretty versatile. It could be something like, I wanna find every cell that's within X microns from the vasculature, or I wanna see every cell A that's in complex with cell B. In this case, we're starting simple. We just wanna find METs. Um, and then we switch our imaging modes and we do local targeted imaging with that three, low 300 nanometer resolution. So this is the sort of scope that you can actually achieve. And so this is a mammary gland shown here. You can see the entire ductal tree on the left in a field of view that's upwards of 13 millimeters. And then we can go and select a single terminal end bud switch imaging modes and go in and see nice single cell events. We can see adipocytes here, these kind of large um, empty looking cells. And we see this kind of terminal embud shown here with the nuclei shown in magenta. And just because I find it beautiful and I love everyone else's setups as well, I wanted to show what the system looks like. Uh, essentially, here's that large travel uh, range stage, so X, Y, Z, theta. It puts the specimen in the central chamber. We have the mesospin illumination here and detection here. We then have the entire CTSLM elevated in a very compact assembly, so we're able to get this down to roughly 18 inches by 24 inches um, by folding it a couple times and using some cage optics, which was... Um, you know, we learned what we do not like about cage systems, but they're take it or leave it. We can actually see also the chamber from a different perspective here. And so yeah, so now we can build up. We've spent a lot of time building the optics. We now also need, you know, these microscopes are no good if you can't control them, which is kind of um, a catch, right? Like we align all these optics. Now we need to learn software engineering. So we've put a lot of time into this as well. We're, we started from scratch, borrowing code from a couple of different people and building up our own code base. It's all Python based. And we're trying to adopt standard, you know, leading software principles. So we want it to be nice, nicely organized into a model view controller. We want to be able to do the processing in real time. So if possible, we're going to use high performance CPU libraries, but if necessary, we can easily grab some of these nice GPU libraries as well that are readily available on via Python, like, so like TensorFlow or whatever. Um, one of the more exciting things is that we created this server client architecture to really be able to grab other libraries out there without creating, um, you know, conflicts within our own repository. So we can actually communicate to separate environments that are running elsewhere and send it data and have it send us back results, which we then use to drive the microscope. And perhaps most ideally is that we've tried to put all the actual steps for acquisition in this highly reconfigurable architecture that allows you to, to do any sequence of events that you want. So that could be, like I said, you could do find cell A in complex with cell B, do autofocusing, measure, um, you know, do segmentation and, and, or if you want to do a completely different order, you know, maybe find boundaries, but you can essentially, we, we jokingly call it like create recipes from essentially acquisition ingredients. And that allows you to do pretty much uh, whatever you want. So you, have, you can be creativity limited, not software limited. Of course, the architecture is something that uh, it's taken a lot of time to build out. Everything is displayed in a GUI. Um, the controller acts as a communication kind of node between the GUI and the model, which can run independently. And as I mentioned, we have this REST API interface that allows us to interact with external things. So whether that be something like cell pose um, or Mesmer or, um, you know, whatever this new meta segment anything, we could basically just put that into their own environment and try to build up communication channels with that. 
So this is what it looks like when it runs now. So on the top left, we have our mesospin illumination, our mesospin detection. We've got our sample hanging into the chamber. We've intentionally spread things out a little bit. We initially had everything aligned so that the sample was co, um, so that the optical axes were perfectly coincident. But now we've given ourselves a little room to breathe. We basically acquire, find our feature of interest and switch over to our high resolution side here fully automatically. And then image that same event here with a known offset between these two paths. So then we can do something like this. And this is really where we're getting down to, you know, getting closer and closer towards the goal. So we can image an entire cleared mouse lung. And we can see that already when this is an inverted image, you can see that there's kind of some interesting features here. So you can see autofluorescent structures here like bronchioles. Now you begin to say like, all right, this is a lot of space to cover, but there's something interesting here. I'm not sure what this is here. We have a large nodule here, a small nodule here, and then something else happening down here. So by doing this whole tissue imaging at 21 millimeters field of view, you can get a global over like overview. We can just zoom in a little bit to our 6x magnification. We can see that that initial small metastatic nodule is actually quite, you know, likely to be a real event. And we zoom in completely with our CTSLM side, and you can now see features as small as like what appear to be little vesicles that have been shed from that tissue. This is this is actually fluorescently labeled. You were a lot of these tissues are highly autofluorescent. But this is um, substantially brighter than this background autofluorescence here. And the tissue is, um, that's something we've had to work around a lot is that different tissues have different autofluorescence, you know, spectra essentially. And so to get this to work in the liver took a lot of work, which is highly, highly autofluorescent. Um, and so now, yeah, we were able to kind of essentially get this global picture, zoom in and do local imaging. And now we ramp up and start to do this for a lot of different tissues. So a huge amount of optimization that goes into this one state, the one slide, but in green, we have nuclei. In magenta, you can see the metastatic cells here, even single cells popping in and out. Um, in the kidney, we, we, we begin to see already what I consider like anecdotal, but slightly interesting uh, features, and that is that we don't actually see a lot of METs inside the kidney. You'd expect, you know, the kidney is a filtration unit. You would think that these glomeruli, which are tight uh, filtration <laughs> regions in that tissue, is maybe where you just lodged metastatic cells. But we actually see these cells kind of more in the supportive tissue outside of the kidney so far. In the lung, it's a complete free for all. These cells are everywhere. So you'll see them in bronchioles, in alveoli, in the vasculature. And so now we can begin to try to ramp up and do things like actually segment and quantify these features. So on the left is a, an image of our, all the nuclei in a lung tissue. And then we have our staining, which is with this anti-RFP CF647. And what we see is kind of a cytosolic fraction of this um, immunofluorescence in the cells that are actually metastasis. Now, by going in, we can then segment out all of our green channels using nice machine learning methods that have been uh, generated here and that we're trying to expand upon at UT Southwestern, as well as our standard DS red channel. And then we can assign each population based upon a dis distance metric. So we can say, you are host if you are negative for this DS red and you are met if you are positive for this DS red. And ultimately you can nicely see kind of almost like a column of metastatic cells that kind of go around the periphery with a kind of a core of, of lung tissue here. That So you can begin to already see quite a bit of detail. Now to do this at scale will be the interesting part. So we're developing better methods with Gowden's lab to try to combine these nice 2D machine learning packages into robust 3D estimates of cell abundance. And so by doing some of that work now, we can take something like Cytox Green, 
Uh, we then have our method to say, are you host or are you cancer? And we can begin to actually count the total number of cells. Now, this is not perfect, but it's pretty good. And I, I would bet it's within a few percent of um, if we were crazy enough to go in and try to do annotate a ground truth. We have a total of 18,394 cells and of which about 11,166 are cancer. This brings up a point that we face, like, you know, the 2D annotation is painful. Um, the 3D annotation is a nightmare in our, in our hands. So, so now that we have the, the microscope, we're starting to get the clearing to be really good. We can really begin to do things like look at the environment. And so we're now looking and asking simple questions like once we find a met, are you inside or outside of the vasculature? And so, for example, we can see in this liver, this very beautiful capillary um, architecture, as well as in the kidney, you see the glomerulus and in the lung, it's everywhere. So we're, we're currently under, you know, working to improve this labeling. It's a little bit dim by my standards, but the goal would then be to be able to segment every nuclei the entire vasculature tree, and then quantitatively measure distance to and from specific tissue-like architectures at the whole tissue scale, um, and eventually for hundreds of tissues. So we'll be filling up hard drives for a little bit. The, the next key is also that we don't wanna just count cells. So like, you know, we, we probably could have done something like this if we, you know, you know, if we wanted to just count cells, we maybe could have just digested the entire tissue and done flow cytometry or something. It would have been nasty, but we want to start to look at context. Where in the tissue are these cells? What kind of molecular features? What, what defines their cell state? Are they pre-apoptotic? Are they undergoing proliferation? Have they recently undergone proliferation? What's the cytoskeletal architecture and how does that organize some of the signaling scaffolds that we're interested in, whether that be uh, GTPA signaling or kinase signaling? Have they under experienced DNA damage? You know, these cells have had to metastasize and squeeze through a lot of very tight constriction points. So you can begin to ask, you know, do some of these microfluidic models that people use that cause DNA damage, are we seeing similar things in a liver or context tissue format? And of course, everyone seems to be incredibly excited about metabolic activity. Now that's a much more challenging thing to go after in my opinion, but if there were good ways to look at say, um, you know, true metabolic activity in a, at a subcellular level in a tissue, I think we'd be all for it. We can essentially go in and count mitochondria. We have a resolution that's sufficient to do that. And if we could have some nice biosensors that are amenable to clear tissue imaging, I think there's some good opportunity there. And so, I think I went a little fast, but not terribly. And I'd rather have more questions than not enough, but um, I'm out of practice. So, you know, in summary, I think we've really put in the last, you know, really just, you know, seven months. That's essentially what we've done. And I'd love to see what the next seven months do. Currently where we're at, um, we have essentially the, the platform that we think we can grow with. We can essentially ask questions that you can't otherwise really ask. We can try to find needles in a haystack, or you know, we could do things like comprehensively evaluate otherwise very convoluted, challenging uh, architectures. Like, you know, if we look at that mammary gland, we could essentially go through and do comprehensive mapping throughout only the ductal's tree rather than imaging the whole volume. So we essentially kind of augment our data overload by selectively imaging the whole region rather than just brute forcing the whole thing. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it, I didn't talk about it too much, but we have this completely reconfigurable software architecture that I think uh, just has totally opened up new opportunities for us. So we can essentially have multiple imaging modalities. We can interface with robotics, which we're gonna start doing because if you have to load hundreds of samples, you want that to be done robotically. Um, and I really hope that we put in the effort that someday, you know, I'm not trying to release it like um, a general software package. I've, I've learned what effort that is from some of my colleagues, but 
I would love to see some of the other labs take some of this up and you know see that kind of um, impact grow. So with that, um, got a great team. So Zach is uh, the first postdoc brave enough to join the lab. He came from your viewers lab and he has been instrumental. Hazel has done all our tissue handling. Jin Long is our like optical microscope building guru. Annie, I found her in the most creative ways. She works in California. She previously worked for IBM. She just wants to be able to stay at home with her parent or with her children. And I said, yes, please um, program when you can. Dax was an intern. He set up essentially all of our GUI. Torkoal is helping us out with the mouse work, Sean Morrison. And of course, uh, we've got the, the, the key group of people here that are incredibly influential. So Andy's been, as always, awesome to just chat with and bounce ideas off of. And of course, Reto, Gowdens, and Bo Ray. And Felix has been really spearheading some of the um, analysis. And apparently, Gabriel's here for the Hannah Grace. And I'm going to go find him later today. So um, with that, I think we got a little time for questions. I appreciate it. This needle in the haystack idea is really interesting to me. And can you, do you think that you're set up both mathematically and microscopically to think about whether or not you're examining tropisms or just whether or not cells go everywhere and happen to continue to survive in particular sites? Yeah, so I think the hope is that we can eventually gauge you know, things like if you see a colony with one cell, two cells, four cells, can you start to build up kind of a, a historical perspective of how many cells came in the first place, right? Like you could almost get to kind of classical um, methods there. Um, and so, and I would like to combine that with molecular ways. So maybe we could do say a tamoxifen pulse chase at a certain moment before, and then we get a window where we said, yes, in the last 24 hours, the cell actually divided. And so uh, I think my perspective is, and it's probably simplified, is that like if the cells can actually proliferate in that tissue, then I would consider that like an effective tropism to some extent. What I'm curious about are the ones that make it and then don't. Yeah. And what happens to them? Do they actually just go into like a um, a stationary, um, you know, train, like, do they go on hold for a while? If that's the case, that's also interesting, like, because, you know, we're, we're not going to try to study that, but, you know, some people have cancer for eight years and you got this latent population of dormant um, nightmare causing populations of cells. And that's a hard thing to study. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of the cool thing is we might be able to go and see in these certain cases where there was no cells detected by bioluminescence, are there cells just there? And if so, I think that's um, that's information that you can't get really right now. Yeah, this seems tailor-made for dormancy. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. This is amazing. Uh, it reminds me a bit of some of the pipelines we have in this building, though, which are huge amount of work for each sample, right? You get awesome data out, but each it's going to be low throughput, right, in terms of large scale, you know, how many times you can do it. Since you aren't trying to go live anyway, you're already working in prepared cleared tissues. Do you have sort of some vision for hyperspectral expansion to give yourself more and more and more labels in each sample? Because you might be able to gain, rather than having to do the same experiment 10 times, if you can do the experiment once and pull all of these other colors out, yeah, uh, that, that might be a way to sort of increase your power. I mean, it's the way we've tried to deal with 3D EM and things in this building because we just can't do them frequently enough. So the more information you get out of each sample, the more powerful it is. Yeah. Well, I think um, there are certain approaches, but then, and that's where I think we're, we're fortunate that if you want to try to do some sort of multiplexed imaging locally in a tissue, then the classical mechanisms are probably going to fail. So you need a more creative approach that maybe uses things like hydrogels or uh, active uh, active methods to drive antibodies into tissues to speed things up because you got all these things um, that are against you. You can't work in BAB. You would have to rehydrate the specimen, relabel. So we are... So sample prep is the problem, not, not actually optics. 
is that, is I that what you're saying? I would say that um, we've scaled up sample prep to the point now where we can handle lots of mice at the same time. It's just a reagent problem. Um, it's a lot of waiting. You know, we'll stain for a week. We'll rinse for several days. We'll stain for another week. Um, we're hoping to get the robotic arm in so that we can truly do the full pipeline. We put a sample on, it finds the boundaries, it does exhaustive imaging, and it only images what it thinks is right. There's a little bit of ways to go for that. For you, where you're, I think you're trying to say is how can you get more molecular information for your buck per specimen? And I think that requires a very creative approach from the methods we're using won't work. Like, in fact, you like, um, you know, I submitted an R1 proposing ways to that work. And I hope that we can talk you into joining us so we can do that together. But um, ultimately, the I think it, it requires a comprehensive approach that takes imaging, probes, clearing, and you will only be able to multiplex chemically if you have all those things in-house. Kevin, can I add to this? I mean, first of all, awesome job. Um, can you describe to me how different, you said it was different liver, kidney, lungs. Yeah. Can you describe to me how different that really is? And how do you optimize even from a labeling and from an imaging perspective? Like yeah, so it was very interesting. It was like, we started out with the lung and things worked pretty easily. And we thought, oh, well, we're making great progress. Well, the lung is predominantly, you know, empty space. So antibodies penetrate well, your reagents get in and out. Um, and, and then we went to the liver and it's this highly epithelial tissue, these tight type cell cell junctions. And it's loaded with P450 and all these hemes that just elevate your, like the red region of your spectra. And so it really was like, we got great signal in our lung and then we go to the kidney and liver and it's a disaster so we took the most obvious approach which is just go further red and that worked now in our hands some of our far red dyes don't perform as nicely but you know if if i were to say like the photophysics of these dyes and these weird solvents is also not very well appreciated you know you get these absorption emission shifts um perhaps we're getting some quenching i don't know but like Otherwise, these salt, these dyes that are like great in aqueous environments are just not as good anymore. So I think there is opportunity there for probes if they want to kind of, it's a very niche probe application, but I would love to learn more about that too. But going further to the red helped us out a lot. So speaking of probes, you use this EFLOR 660. Did you need that like flow cytometry, super bright polymer-based dye to get signal or can you use other things? So that EFLOR 660 was just what we happen to have. So that vasculature labeling is a little bit sadistic. What we do is retroorbital injection into a living mouse to label the vasculature with a directly conjugated primary antibody. So we don't get the amplification that we would like from a secondary antibody. And so far it has proven to be quite valuable to have that. Now we're exploring different fluorophores for that. Um, that e 660 is not ideal because while we got good vasculature labeling, it now took up the channel we need to see mets and livers. So uh, we have to kind of shuffle things around. Um, and so, so far, that is the one good result we've had. We're hoping that by moving to the green, we'll have some good results there too. All right. Fantastic talk, Kevin. Um, I was wondering a little bit about your sampling strategy because going from kind of the mesoscale to kind of Microscope, I would be tempted to go look at all the things that look interesting. Yeah. But but I think actually what you might want to do is kind of sample kind of um, different distinct regions. And so I'm wondering what your kind of strategy there is going between the two scales. Yeah, so um, 
I mean, I could see perhaps if I'm reading the question that perhaps we should sample some other spaces too, just as a nice uh, internal control to make sure we're not um, missing anything with the mesoscale imaging. I think that's a good idea. The plus side is that because we do the mesoscale imaging, I think it is possible to do a lot of local targeted imaging and it not be detrimentally long. You know, if we go in and we image, say, a 40 micron volume in 50 different spots, it's not a big deal. It's when we try to do, you know, 30,000 tiles that becomes a problem. And then we have to rely on all the other tools to actually deal with that data. So I think that's an interesting idea that maybe we should actually introduce in our sampling um, where we have directed sampling as well as indirect kind of uh, random sampling as well as just a built-in control. Kind of follow, following along the lines of uh, Thanks. what what Mark was saying, I'm wondering like um, like have you thought about like brute forcing just a few? It might be kind of interesting, right? I mean, because yeah. you have the capability, right, to to do it, and you probably would learn things because you could do the whole organ. Yeah, I think um, we are definitely doing that. And I think from a optics perspective, there's some interesting stuff there too. Is like how well can we perform over that scale? Now, of note, we have had to resort to slicing some of these tissues as well. So the lung, we can do very large tissues, but we now slice the lungs or the livers and kidneys. Um, yeah, I think our most initial approach was to actually do some brute force imaging as well. And the hope is that with the faster bandwidth, maybe that factor of four or five really does kind of save us a little bit. Um, you know, some of the data I showed, like the stem cell niche, I think took five days to image. Um, so, but from a software perspective, that would absolutely test the limits of like how reproducible we can run this, how like, do we have enough, um, you know, have we done a good job engineering the system? Yeah, I think from both a biology, uh, hardware and a software perspective, we would have things to gain. From Mark's perspective, we would be able to say, did we actually detect all these cells? So we do this macro scale imaging, we detect 25 pop like nodes, and then we do exhaustive imaging and we probably would have to do like a human in the loop to make sure that it passes the muster from a biologically like motivated perspective and then likewise can our optics and our software actually drive that acquisition process and, and sort of the um the other thing i was thinking about is like there's the sort of you know approach that was taken here with like drosophila brain where you just brute force by parallelization right so if yeah. you had 10 of these things that were operating continuously yeah, you know that. I mean, that's sort of another strategy, which, you know, I mean, it, it seems like you're yeah, just tell the NIH that strategy. And... Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the, the the last thing I was thinking about as I was listening to you is like it seems like, you know, another way to do this would be like to like sort of like resin embed and then slice. I mean, for the kind of brute forcing thing. I mean, like, what are the pros and cons of that approach of like taking these organs, you know, basically making them hard, slicing them, and then imaging yeah. them that way. So. From the resin embedding, I think that the advantage there is that perhaps you could do, um, let's say you took a different strategy and you really wanted to push even higher resolution. I think you could use higher numerical aperture objectives. You could do some imaging in say like an oblique plane microscope format, and then you take it over, slice it off and image it again. So there's been some beautiful work on that. Um, I think this, yeah, combining serial, to have resin embedded with serial sectioning allows you to push the, the optics a little bit harder. Uh, we basically compromise and say, you know, we're, for now we're happy with our low 300 nanometer resolution. That's good enough to see what we need to see, but there are a lot of cases where we wish we had more. Um, what else? So resin embedding, are there any other advantages I would say? You know, if you do resin embedding, then perhaps some of these cyclic immunofluorescence methods could work too. If you did serial sectioning and then had just a huge array of tissues that you could then cyclically go through, that's another advantage I think that you'd have. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about having to penetrate through 1.5 millimeters of tissue with an antibody. You could just do it on a five micron section, right? So there's definitely advantages to that. And yeah. The hope, I think, is that with the robotic loading and unloading that we would be able to have the capacity to image this with the throughput we need, but we'll find out. 
still not entirely sure how long it'll take, but if we have to build another, we'll we'll try to dig up some money. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. All right, thank you. Yeah, we have one more question. Yeah, uh, so this is just kind of following on with what everyone else is saying. Um, this kind of methodology for automation is kind of near and dear to my heart. And one of the big benefits that I see is being able to, you know, build up these statistics for where things are. And you have this really nice uh, meso scale imaging that maybe you don't get a hit on. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I don't know how much uh, signal you're getting from your auto fluorescence, but I think it's kind of uh, important to, to see in these kind of cases, not just where things are, but where things aren't and yeah. what you can learn from that with the additional. It's really hard with kind of like what Chris was saying with the spectral space that you have. Yeah. Um, but can you, what can you learn from that? And are you thinking about ways to kind of leverage that white space? Yeah, so more comprehensively cataloging the entire system, right? Yeah, presence or absence. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not entirely sure what the, you know, I think our first approach is to really just acquire the data and then stare at it and then come up with the next approach, you know, like as a very interdisciplinary project, we're working with, um, you know, cancer biologists, they're not used to dealing with imaging data like this. So I think by just being able to point at cells and say, you know, I trust that their their knowledge of why some cells would be adjacent to a bile duct versus not would be, I trust their opinion more than mine at this point. But um, um, it's a good point. Uh, building up the automation to more exhaustively do that and for these low copy number or not copy number, but events is I think the whole goal though. Because that sort of thing can pop out hopefully. Yeah. Thanks, great talking. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.